Thank you so much for sharing that with us. What a blessing. Would you bow your heads with me? <clears throat> God in heaven, we just continue to bask in your presence here and seek your spirit. So, Father, as we um, continue in our service, uh, come and just delight our minds and our souls and uh, speak to us, Father. Uh, let us know what your will and what your heart is, and we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. It, uh, it's always a great thing to worship and uh, appreciate everyone who's helped and come and been part of our service. Thank you um, to everyone. Especially loved having Chloe up here. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, she's always welcome. And uh, it's good to see Alicia singing and leading. We don't get to have Zach and Alicia too much longer. And uh, I just feel so grateful every time we get to see them uh, before they head off to the seminary. And I am excited for them and so glad uh, that you guys are part of our church. So um, hope, looking forward to you coming back already. <laughs> um, you know, when I was trying to think about what to preach over the summer months, I, uh, you always think about, well, how much of your uh, congregation is going to be there, and, and it's probably not a good time to launch any major initiatives, you know, and things like that, because so many people are moving, traveling, and uh, in transition, and, or just doing other things. Uh, but I decided to talk on the subject, uh, a willing heart. It, it is on the subject of, of giving, on giving. And it is partly inspired by the fact that I am so excited that we've met budget two months in a row. And I don't know if Kelly Sue is here today or not, but I think I read in one of the emails she sent, oh, there you are. I'm sorry. I looked right over you. Um, so it's been a while since we've met budget. I don't know if it's been multiple years, 16 months, and then to have it two months in a row. It is worth celebrating, isn't it? And so the faithfulness of, of the church and the excitement uh, to, for us to reach that. Now, a lot of churches are always just a little bit below budget, and they have to do things to make things work, but it, it is a great thing, and, and so it's partly inspired to celebrate that. But I appreciate, too, what Alicia said at the beginning of worship um, of, on the song 10,000 Reasons, that part of our relationship with God isn't always just to get blessed by Him, but part of our relationship is also to be a blessing to Him. And it's an interesting thought. Um, you know, all relationships depend upon each party giving. Have you ever been in a relationship where it seemed like you were always the one giving and the other person wasn't doing anything or their share? It's not always the greatest of relationships. Uh, uh, I remember in high school, I had uh, several friends, but some that I were very close with. Um, and it became something almost of a joke amongst us, uh, and we were good friends. But there was one of my friends that whenever we would go out, whether it was to Taco Bell or to a movie or we needed gas, he never had money, never had money. And it's a true story, too. We even once caught him with money. One of my friends, we were at a video rental store, and he was doing the same thing. He says, guys, I don't have any money. One of my friends went up behind him and went, put his hand in his pocket and pulled out a wad of cash. And he goes, oh, no, 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 it's not my, I'm holding it for a friend. And we're just like, you're pathetic. You're such pathetic. You know, and he, we were good friends. And it, was, it became kind of a running joke. It was never more than a few bucks here or there that we would each contribute. But I had another friend. Uh, he was one of my best friends. And Casey was my friend, too. And if Casey was watching this right now, I know he'd laugh, too. But I had another friend who um, we were very close. And whenever we would go out and, and we would order from... from uh, Taco Bell was a big thing. <laughs> we would order it. This is back in the day, too, when you can get tacos for 25 cents, okay? Um, both of us had minimum wage jobs. I was making four ten an hour. I was working at Montgomery Wards. Do you remember Wards? Do you remember Wards? Yeah. I was actually working with them when they went bankrupt. It wasn't my fault. So, okay. Um, he was working at McDonald's. So, and we were both in high school. We weren't working full time, but we had just enough money to buy gas and do a few things. And Taco Bell was a big thing. And we would go and we would make our order. They'd give us the bill. And, and we didn't count it up. We would just both pull out our, and we'd just pool our money. And we weren't keeping tabs. It wasn't like, oh, you paid $4 last time, so you owe me $4. No, you owe me the. When we go to buy gas, you know, poor, poor high school kids, you know, it would just be, how much do you have? We never kept track of it. It was never, oh, you owe me this amount or you paid that amount. And it was just this thing that we knew we trusted each other. 
And it wasn't a big deal. We were going to work together to, to make it work out. And it, it, it was just a unique experience that I remember. And we even acknowledged it later on in our, our days in high school that that was cool, that that was unique. Each of us uh, understood that in this relationship, we were going to give so that we could have a, an enjoyful uh, time without worrying about things like that. A lot of Christians get upset when you talk about giving. A lot of people get upset when you talk about charity and giving, and, and they feel that that's uh, uh, you know, so personal or, or it's, it's overdone or somehow it's an abusive thing to do. But I just want to share with you, every healthy relationship involves giving. If you're in a relationship with God or with anyone else and you struggle with the idea of what your uh, opportunities to give are, that's not the healthiest relationship. It's just very simple when you think of it like that. And when you think about, well, one more illustration and then we'll get on to the kids' quiz. Um, uh, when you think about giving to God, blessing the Lord, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, there's a part of it you think, well, what can I give to God? You, do any of you have friends or, or family where they already have everything? And, you know, and we, we happen to be in a, a, a comfortable society where if you've planned your life well and you've worked hard, most of, you know, you have the little things in life that, that you need, and there's not a whole lot out there that's critical. Now, some of us are in different areas, and I understand that, but I think most of us know someone that when their birthday or anniversary comes around, you think, I have no idea what to get them. They already have the clock. They got the candles. They got, uh, they got this. They got that. And um, some people view God like that and say, what can I give God? I mean, he's pretty much the king. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's, it's uh, how, how can I give anything to God? And we spiritualize it and we say, well, I'll give him, you know, my heart, my mind, my soul. And those are not uh, menial things. Those are important things. But I'll share with you that as a parent, if you want to bless me, bless my children. And I get the blessing. Gina and I have an aunt. It's actually Gina's aunt. Um, that lived fairly close to us in Spokane. And, and she's a, a wonderful person. We love her to death. But she would just sometimes come by the house and she'd just say, hey, can I take your kids to ice cream? Just out of the blue. She would even sometimes take Bailey on her own one-on-one. -on -one. And you know, Bailey doesn't have a lot of friends. There's not a lot of people that dote on an autistic teenager. And when she would come by the house and say, I just want to bless Bailey. Can I take her to Starbucks? You want to know what? That made her like an all-star in my world. When someone dotes on my children because they love them, guess who gets the blessing? I get the blessing. I don't need ice cream, okay? I, you know, if you want to, I, I don't need, well, I like ice cream, don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know, or take me to, to a restaurant or a Starbucks or something. But when you bless my children, you are endearing yourself to me in very powerful ways. Bless the Lord. You want to bless the Lord, then show how you are going to bless his children. So that's kind of a, a little bit of a highlight here of what we're going to be talking about, a willing heart. And I'd like someone to help me with a microphone. Would someone help me? Because for the kids quiz, I'd like to uh, have uh, the kids be able to be heard. And uh, is, I'm not getting any uh, action out of this. Oh, thank you, Sarah. So, once again, I have this problem with our advancer. Did I do that? I sound like Steve Urkel. Did I do that? <laughs> All right. Some of you know that reference. <laughs> what are some occasions that we give gifts to each other? Now, most of our kids are somewhat over here, but this is open for anybody, uh, for our kids particularly. What are some occasions? I want to have young people uh, speak for the most part. What are some occasions that we give gifts? And Anna is, oh, I see Anna and Emma. You guys can wrestle it out. Okay, Emma. Christmas. Christmas. Anna, what did you want to say? Birthdays, Christmas, yeah. Are there any others you can think of? Baby showers. Baby showers, Bob. I know you're big into those. Graduation. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we just had one, didn't we? Graduation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Boy, some of these kids are getting older and older, aren't they? So, uh, so yeah, we kind of think of the, the major ones. Oh, go ahead, Addie. Oh, well done, young one. Well done. Okay, so yeah, Christmas, birthdays, the milestones, graduations, anniversaries, retirement, romance. How come none of the kids thought about that? 
you know, when you're, when you're wooing someone, don't you, uh, I, I, I've heard at least you, you do gifts for the person that you are interested in. Moving right along. <laughs> what are some occasions that we give gifts to God? Now, in particular, like when do we collect offerings? I'm trying to be specific here. When do we collect offerings? I want to have these kids to help us out here. This isn't meant to be a trick question. When do we collect offerings? We've already done it a couple of times today, if that's helpful at all. Owen's going to help us out. Sabbath school? Sabbath school! Great! When else? All right, some of you uh, helpful church members need to help out. Some of you just say it out loud. When do we collect offerings? Children's story, VBS. Jim says. V Did you say VBS? Wow, okay, very good. So children's story or children's offering at VBS. Come on, let's hear just a few others. Evangelism. For evangelism? In gathering. In gathering. Wow, that's something we haven't heard of in a while. Okay. All right, so just to, to, to move this along. You know, Sabbath school is changed, okay? It used to be historically that Sabbath school was one of the major mission-giving uh, opportunities that we had in the church. And to this day, if you pull out your quarterly and you look out at the back of it, it'll show you what the mission offering is for the quarter. It's the Inter-American Division. Montemorelos is in here and um, some of the missions in Mexico and throughout Central America and the Caribbean. And uh, there used to be mission stories. And the offerings taken up in Sabbath school were the major missional offerings that we donated as a church. Now, those offerings have almost totally dried up. Almost totally dried up in, in North America. And so I, I'm not saying, you know, that's good or bad. It's just, it's just part of the evolution of how things work. And, and it is unfortunate um, that uh, uh, a lot of churches don't even bring enough offering to cover their uh, Sabbath school expense during Sabbath school because uh, things have changed. And, and Sabbath school itself is kind of becoming, Dan, Daniel, like in gathering. It's kind of becoming something that's not the major part of a church anymore. And uh, some are, we're, we're working to work on that here. Family worship service, children's offering, camp meeting. And yes, basically every time we have a meeting, uh, there's kind of a running joke. It's not an Adventist meeting unless we take up an offering at some point. But you know, there's something biblical about that too. The Bible says you should never come before the Lord empty-handed. It was just part of the culture of religion and worship. If you were going to be in the presence of God, it was natural and normal to always bring something. So um, I guess we kind of fall in, into that idea when we, we take up our offerings. Why does God ask us for gifts or for money? I really want to hear a few kids answer this. Why, do we, why does God ask us for gifts or money? So that we can sacrifice for him. To sacrifice for him. Thank you, Melise. And I'm looking, I know you ladies are back there too. And so if you want to shout something out, I mean, this is for everyone that's younger in the congregation, Emily and Natalie. I see someone. Okay. Where? Oh, right here. Wonderful. So we can help that don't have. So we can help those who don't have? Yeah. That's well Perfect. said. One or two more from our kids. Come on, let's have a few kids. Why does God ask us for our money or for our gifts? There's so much that can be learned from the heart of our children. I know I'm putting you on the spot. All right, you highsies, you're letting me down. I, I, was, I had high hopes, but now I'm, I'm crushed. Because when we have, when we give money to a, um, a situation, we have buy-in to it. It changes our heart. Oh, very good. There's buy-in. Changes, changes our heart. Investment. Thank you, moms, for, for helping us out with that. Um, I just have one more. So, yeah, to express our love and gratitude to God, just because we're thankful for what God has given us. It expresses love in God. To empower the gospel. You've, you've probably heard an offering call before where someone says, now God doesn't need your money. Have you ever heard that before? Now God doesn't need your money, but you know we're going to take up this offering anyways. I, one of my colleagues 
That, that phrase just drove him nuts. Now, in a universal sense, that's true, obviously. God doesn't need our money, but he has given us an infrastructure by which it requires resources in order for the church and the work of the gospel ministry to move forward. So, does God need your money? Yes, he does need your money, okay? This is the plan and the way in which it works. And when uh, the church and the ministry is without resources, it does not do all that it can to spread the gospel, to help us combat our own selfishness and greed. And we could make a, a much longer list than this. But here's the main one. Because giving is godly. What's the most famous Bible verse in the world? John three sixteen. And what does that verse say? For God so loved the world. He so loved the world that he did what? He gave. That's the character of God to give. He gives us everything. He gave us Jesus. He gave us his son. Giving is godly. And if we want to be like Christ, if we want to have the character of God, we will do those things that express His divine character. And that includes unselfish giving. And of course, we mean more than just monetary things. You can give time, and you can give talents, and you can give other things like that. But in a material sense, um, the resources that we have um, are one of the more practical ways. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Just this one more, and I think we're done. All right, fill in the blank. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. I'm not meaning to pressure you. <laughs> For God loves a person who gives how? How are they supposed to give? Who gives sadly? Who gives angrily? Who gives bitterly? We're going to go over here first. Who gives how? Cheerfully. Cheerfully. Is that what you were going to say too? I knew it. That's the answer. Sarah, thank you so much for being our wonderful microphone technician this morning. Yes, God loves a person who gives cheerfully. That's the idea. Each must decide in your heart how much to give and to give so cheerfully. Now, there is something that uh, I... I have found in my life it's hard for me to give cheerfully. For most of our married life, I have done our taxes uh, on my own. Um, every now and then, I, when things get more complicated, or there's something strange, I'll go to a CPA. Um, and I don't begrudge them for what they charge because I realize this is not an easy science that they do. But um, the few times I've had to pay someone, it's like 1% of my salary just to get my taxes done. And it just, ugh. So why do they have to make this so complicated? For, so, for the most part, I've done my own taxes. So about a month ago, because I always wait till the last minute, um, and the IRS gave us an extra month this year because of COVID, um, I did my regular um, uh, taxes. And what I do, I always do it on a Sunday because I, I need lots of time and, and I don't need other things on my focus. So I wait till a Sunday. I go into a closed room. Back in Spokane, we had an office um, here uh, in uh, we live in Cave Creek. Um, our office is kind of in our bedroom. I close the door, and I either set up a table, or this time I, I uh, had our bed made, and I spread out all our documents all over our bed. Okay, and then, very important, I put on Hawaiian music. I do. This is true. I always put on Hawaiian music. Okay, John Kiawe or Polly or Hapa. Uh, my favorite is uh, Kaylee Reichel, but who got me into Hawaiian music was uh, Israel Kamakolioli. You know, he's your favorite too, I know. I realize that. Uh, but I always put on Hawaiian music, and I do that for two reasons. So when the tears start to flow from paying my taxes, um, that slack guitar and ukulele soothes me. Or when my face gets red in anger from paying my taxes, that soothing Hawaiian music helps. I've always put on Hawaiian music when I do my taxes. Again, I lay out everything, and I go through, and it takes me a long time because we have so complicated taxes. But anyway, so it's hard to have a willing heart when I pay my taxes, but just to be a little um, vulnerable with you, this was an odd year for us. Our federal taxes came out to be about 18% of our gross. That's a little higher than we've normally paid, but we had a weird year because we moved and uh, purchased a home, sold a home, and things like that. It's normally closer to 16, but this year it went up to about 18%. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I struggled with doing my own taxes. I couldn't quite figure out where that other 2% came. But uh, anyways, I did figure it out. 18% uh, 
of uh, gross taxes went to, um, and both, most of that, by the way, is to Social Security, because as a minister, I'm considered self-employed, and so I have to pay 15.3% of my income without deductions um, uh, just for um, Social Security and Medicare. So 18%. Now, um, Arizona was messed up this year because we were only here a part year. I estimate that moving forward, our state taxes will be about 2%. And I'm thankful that in Arizona, we can donate that um, to or direct that, most of it. And in our case, it will be most of it, I think, to our schools. So um, we'll be doing that whenever we do have Arizona state uh, income tax. So got to pay that. Our property taxes also we have to pay. And I didn't pay this. Uh, I'm just using this as an example. Works out to be about 5% of our combined annual income. And then just to throw in a few miscellaneous taxes as well, and there are a lot of taxes built in everywhere, but if you consider, you know, your sales tax and service taxes, fuel, uh, utility, every time you pay your phone bill, your water bill or something, there's a certain portion of that, in some cases a large portion of it, that goes to taxes. Probably about another 5% of our annual income goes to these other variety of taxes. So that means I'm paying about 30, I, I, we, <laughs> we are paid about 30% of our gross annual income is going to taxes. And by the way, um, we, again, I've done our taxes every year and we've grown accustomed to the lifestyle of not having this money. So it's not so onerous. Um, to live in America, that's not bad. I want to share with you. To have the freedoms and privileges and opportunities that this country provides, 30% is a lot of money to pay in taxes. But, you know, we get pretty quality living in the United States. And a lot of that is because of our tax system. By the way, the only tax that makes sense to me is property tax. The rest of them don't make sense to me at all. And they're just not fair. But anyways, they are there and we pay them. And so, but just right off the top. And by the way, this is slightly under the average for our income bracket. We, uh, because we give more to charity than average and things like that, most people in our income bracket are more closer to 35%. 35%, um, and depending, because taxes are complicated, there's also the tax wedge and things like that. And Brendan, you, know, you and I, we could talk all day on this because it's just so wonderful and fascinating, but um, a lot of different ways of looking at it. So when you think about God asking for our 10%, it's not, it's not even as much as what we give to the government. So we, we do try to pay 10%. Um, we, we try. We give 10% of our income uh, uh, as, as part of our uh, obligation to God in, in, in the tithe. And I'll talk a little bit more about the tithe in just a second. But I always find it interesting that a lot of people want to treat their tithe like the taxes. They're looking for deductions. They're looking for deductions. And say, well, I know it's supposed to be 10% of my increase, but really I'm in so much debt and this, I didn't get this and this. And by the time they deduct so much out of their income, they really don't have any tithe to pay at all. And I would just share with you, I don't know if that's the best spiritual way of looking at uh, uh, the tithe. We don't have as much time this morning to go into everything. but And then our goal, um, particularly ever since my wife started working, was to give an additional 10% in offerings or in charity. We have other charities that we support um, on a regular basis besides just giving to the local church. Now, we haven't always been able to do that. When, when we were in college, we were poor college students. There was almost no money after we always paid the tithe, but there was almost no money to give for offerings. There really wasn't. There was just, we were living very limited. But we, what we did decide to do is if we couldn't give money, we would still try to support the church and work. And so one year we actually, for free, worked for the church as the church custodians. So while we were in Walla Walla, um, we would go once a week to our, our local church and we would clean the church and we didn't charge the church anything because that was our way of giving. We didn't have money to give, but we wanted to give something. And so that worked for us. And, uh, but God has, has blessed and so it's our goal. So when you think of that, 50% of our income is not at our, uh, you know, we are not living on that. But here's the thing. We have built our lifestyle around that expectation. If you're not accustomed to giving, or if you're not giving uh, to, to the area where you may feel convicted to give and have a willing heart to give, um, it's harder to get there. If you're used to living on 90% of your income, then when the tax bill comes and they ask you for that other 20%, it's a real bother. It's a real problem because you've built a lifestyle about depending on that. You know what I'm saying? So the same is true when it comes to how we give to the Lord. If we have designed our life where we need to have more of our money so that it cuts into our ability to give, we need to sit down with the Lord and say, what can I cut from my life? 
Um, how many of you know who Larry Burkett is? Oh, Kelly knows. A few of you know. One of my favorite Christian financial advisors, Larry Burkett. He was the head of Crown Financial Ministries. Just a humble, great guy who used to listen to him on the radio all the time. I'll never forget Larry Burkett one time saying, I have worked with people who made a few thousand dollars a year, and I've worked with people who make a few million dollars a year. And they always have the same thing to say to me. They say, if I only made a little bit more, then I could give. It's all about the heart. It's all about the heart and how we have chosen to organize our lives around our, 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 uh, our income and our resources. So that's kind of an amazing thing to think of. 50% of the annual production that we make um, does not stay within our disposable income. Part of that is because it's confiscated through taxes. And part of that is because we have decided uh, to live charitable lives in response to God's plan to pay um, a tithe and to also pay in offerings and charity. Um, by the way, in case you're interested, according to a couple of articles, one in the USA Today and the National Phil Philanthropic Trust, which monitors American charitable givings, in 2018, the average American gave between 2 and 4% of their income to charities. Okay? By the way, every year, that's going lower and lower. Every, now, 2020 is going to be a banner year. Because of COVID and everything, it looks like a lot of trusts and foundations and organizations got, uh, and plus there was a lot of money pumped into the economy through stimulus. Um, it looks like that there's going to be a bump up in 2020. But, but generally, American charitable giving is going down every year. And by the way, the higher your income, um, uh, statistically, the less you will give to charity by percentage. And that's just a fact. Most people that make uh, millions of dollars give very little to charity. Or when they do give to charity, they give to the big things like universities and museums. They don't typically give to the Union Gospel Mission and Salvation Army or even to their local church. Can you imagine one church that had a billionaire that tithed? What kind of church that would be? If you had one billionaire who paid an honest tithe. Now, there may be a few out there. There may be. I don't, I don't see you know, some of the mega churches and all that. Maybe that's how some of these preachers af uh, afford the diamond-studded swimming pools. I don't know. Okay? But just if one billionaire paid an honest tithe, how much that would impact a, a local church or a community. Um, so, and I'm not saying that they're not um, uncharitable people. Bill Gates and others, they give it. But as a percentage of their, their actual income, it's quite low. The poor, the poor typically give the most to charity. It's just a fact. Those who make less than $30,000 a year usually give around 10% of their money to charity. So, anyways, so just one story to reflect on as we talk about this whole topic of, of the spiritual act of worship of giving. We come to the book of Exodus, and we remember that the children of Israel have just been taken out of slavery. They've been taken out of poverty, you might say, all right? And, and both literally and spiritually as they've been brought up out, and God gives to the children of Israel, these wonderful gifts as part of their salvation. He gives them the law, all right? He says, you need to understand how to avoid going back into slavery, okay? You, and he gives them the sanctuary, okay? But he also gives them the spoils of Egypt. Do you remember that? Do you remember that the Egyptians were so anxious to get those pesky Israelites out that as they left, they, umped, they emptied their, their treasure chests and they gave them their idols and they gave them uh, the, the expensive clothing and said, get out of here, we're tired of these plagues. And so they, 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 they took the spoils of Egypt with them as they went to the wilderness. And right after the Lord gives them the instructions of the law and some of the sanctuary, he says this, tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me from every man who's heart moves him, you shall raise my contribution. Now that we do know that there's a difference between the tithe and the offering. This was not the tithe. This is a separate offering that God invites his people to participate in. And then he begins to list, they shall bring gold and bronze and, and scarlet and precious onyx stones. And say, so, well, where did they get all that? They were slaves in Egypt, right? So where did they get all the, the, the things to build the sanctuary with? They got it from Egypt. That's where they got it. They didn't have it because they've been saving it up in, in, their, in their home chests at home. They got it because the Egyptians gave it to them. And so there's a great response to this. And uh, again, Moses says, let them construct a sanctuary, the Lord says, that, they, that I may dwell among them. So the purpose of this offering was the organization and the construction of that plan, of that illustration of the plan of salvation. Through their giving... The plan, of, the plan of salvation is built and illustrated. 
and they could work through that um, throughout their giving. This is repeated in Exodus 35. Same instructions. Moses spoke to all the congregation of the sons, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take from among you a contribution. Whoever is of, and here's where my sermon title comes, a willing heart. No amount was prescribed, no necessity or mandate was prescribed. He said, let them choose in their own heart what is appropriate for them. Let them bring it as the Lord's contribution. He goes on to say in verses 21 and 22, everyone whose heart stirred him, everyone whose spirit moved him, came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work of the tent of the meeting and all of its service and for all the holy garments. And then in verse 20. Oh, continues in verse 22. Then all those whose hearts moved them, both men and women, came and brought brooches and earrings, signet rings, bracelets, all articles of gold. So did every man who presented an offering of gold to the Lord. Again, they got this because God gave it to them. God gave it to them. And then verse 29. The Israelites, all the men and women, whose heart moved them to bring material for the work which the Lord had commanded them um, through Moses to be done, brought a free will offering to the Lord. God always laid it upon people's hearts to, said, to, to allow them to choose what they felt would be appropriate to them. And it's going to be different for each individual. It's going to be different. Like I said, when we were in college, we had almost nothing. We had very little that we could add to the VBS program or to camp meeting or to a children's offering or things like that. But a different time of life comes along, and you, you pray, and you ask the Lord to guide you. Now, there's a couple of things I want to say about this contribution that the Israelites gave for the original construction of the sanctuary. If you remember the story, they brought so much that Moses had to eventually tell them, stop it! I mean, can you imagine a church service? Uh, Kelly Sue, let's imagine a church service. Let's have it this uh, coming uh, week where people bring so much that we have to say, stop it! We have too much! You need to stop bringing your offerings. Now, this was obviously a very dramatic and momentous occasion when people did this. But some people have looked at this story and said, well, it was easy for the Israelites to give because they didn't really earn it. Okay? They were slaves, and it was only as they were getting kicked out of Egypt and as they're escaping Egypt that the Egyptians forced upon them these gold and jewels and bracelets and all the scarlet clothing and, and, and all the blue and, and everything. So they, they didn't really earn it. They, so they, it was easy for them to say, yeah, I don't care about this gold. I don't care about these jewels. Go ahead and take it. The Lord says you want it. My heart's moved. Go ahead and take it. Now, there may be some truth to that. It is sometimes easier for people who've been in poverty that get an, uh, a sudden increase to turn around and be generous with that. We see that sometimes with athletes or, or personalities where they write a hit song and they come from nothing and all of a sudden they get millions. Um, oftentimes they do, you know, give back to the community and, and, and things like that. Um, so there may be an element of truth to that, but I don't think human nature has changed that much. A lot of people, when they get a treasure trove, they don't just turn around and give it away uh, so easily, okay? Uh, I think human nature is, wow, I can finally start building my kingdom. I can now finally, uh, you know, buy that guitar I've been looking at. You know, I, I can finally get that new oven that I just really want that's got the nice top and everything's going to work perfect. Uh, I think human nature is that when we get that increase is that we want it. We want to keep it. So I don't think it was as easy as we sometimes make it out to be that they were just dumb Israelites who only knew slavery and didn't know what to do, and so they just turned it over without thought or intentionality at all. I think there was a deep movement and understanding among the Israelites that the only reason they had freedom and the only reason they had these treasures was to begin with, to begin with was because God gave it to them. And that everything they owned and everything they are originated with God. And that was the motivating factor. And I'm telling you, your world and your understanding of giving gets revolutionized when you begin to appreciate and understand that everything you are and everything you have does come from God. Um, so, I, can I tell you something, Kim? So there's a certain television show that I watched growing up. I wasn't supposed to watch it. It wasn't one of the banned ones. It was just one of the ones that my mom kind of <sighs> looked at me like when she saw me watching it. It's called The Simpsons. Oh, so you've seen it. <laughs> I watched a little bit of The Simpsons growing up. And by the way, um, some of you who know who um, Professor Don Leatherman is, 
he will stand up and argue all day long that The Simpsons has more positive spiritual messaging in it than any other sitcom that's come out in the last 40 years. The Simpsons has more positive spiritual messages in it. Anyways, I'm not here to defend The Simpsons. I was watching The Simpsons. Um, and I'll never forget an episode I watched when they, they, they go to church in The Simpsons. They pray at their meals in The Simpsons. Um, and in one of the episodes, there's a character named Bart. He's kind of the rambunctious son. And they asked him to pray for the meal. And I'm like 14, 15 years old when I watch this. And I'll just never forget it because Bart prays like this. He goes, Dear Lord, thank you for this meal. But um, actually, we bought this uh, meal with our own money. So thanks for nothing. Amen. Yeah, very crass, right? Very inappropriate. We understand that. Okay. But I'll never forget that thinking, you know, there's a part of you, be honest, there's a part of you and there's a part of the human condition that says, well, you know, there's some truth to that. I went to college. I took out the loans. I worked hard to get the job. I put on the suit and tie. I went to work every day. I got the paycheck. I paid my bills. I made sure the house was in order. It's mine. God didn't give it to me. I did it. I worked hard. I sacrificed. I'm not giving anything to... I, God didn't give me anything. I earned every penny, and it's mine. None of you have ever thought that, I know. Just me and my sinfulness at times. I have thought that. And there's a part of that little prayer that even as a young man, I'm 15, I'm earning money to buy a car, I'm, I'm mowing lawns, you know, I'm putting away all my Christmas money, you know, because I'm, I'm looking to become in 16 and everything. And there's a part of me where, where I saw that prayer and I thought, wow, he's really got it right. He's really got it right. But when you remove yourself just for a second and you think about who is it that gave you life? Who is it that gives you strength? day to day? Who is it that keeps you healthy when you make wise choices? Who is it that gives you ambition and endurance? Who is it that gives you the opportunities that you have? Does God just sit back and just, is he like the watchmaker? He just turns the watch and says, whatever happens, I'm not going to be involved at all. Whether you succeed or fail, it's just all on you. Is that our understanding of God? Or do we have a deep appreciation that every step along our way, everything that happens in our life, every good and perfect gift, James says, comes down from the Father of lights. Every blessing that we receive, yes, God wants us to work hard. Yes, we do earn our money. Yes, there is a work ethic. Yes, there's a responsibility that we have. But as believers, as Christians, we understand that God is the one who is working out His will in our lives every day. And our salvation and our material resources are gifts from Him. They are gifts from Him. So the Israelites understood that. Their freedom, their salvation, and their wealth came from God. And they felt it a great privilege and joy to, as they prayed and as the heart moved to give to the Lord in such abundance as they were able to build one of the most magnificent structures that's ever been built. Originally the tent of meeting, and then ultimately when they got into the promised land, they built the temple of Solomon as well in a similar setting. So how much should I give in tithes and offerings? Like I said, I, I would encourage you, don't deal with deductions in your tithe, okay? The, the Bible talks about bringing a whole tithe into the storehouse. I'm not going to, should I tithe on my net? Should I tithe on my gross? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say more about that in, in, in just a second. And then as the offerings go, um, the Bible encourages us to give as the heart is willing. Oh, by the way, I want to say one other thing. I know, I know that um, service is wrapping up here. Do you know that the Bible says almost nothing about what the tithe was used for? It says almost nothing. We know that it was the inheritance of the, Le of the Levites. So they were not given land. They weren't farmers. They didn't go in the marketplace and trade. Okay, They did not uh, go to the spice markets and things like that. The tithe was the inheritance. So it was the wage of the Levites. That's how they were paid. Okay? So we do know that, but there would be, can you imagine all the other Israelites bringing their tithe to the temple um, to, to give to them? That would be more than sufficient for the few Levites that worked in the temple from day to day. 
Do you know what they did with the rest of the tithe? Most scholars and commentators believe, and, and uh, Jacob Milgram, the great Jewish commentator, uh, says this to uh, a large extent, extent, it was burned. It was burned. They burned it up. The tithe was the Lord's. It belonged to the Lord. And the excess that could not be used by the Levites, and they had a, they had a wage, it was burned. Where do you think they got all the lambs and all the sacrifices that were used, the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, all the sacrifices that were during the, uh, during the uh, uh, festivals and things like that. Where do you think it came from? The Levites weren't raising animals out behind the temple, okay? And these weren't the animals that were brought for the Levit Levitical offerings in, in, Levit in Levite, Leviticus chapters 1 through 5, okay? They burned it. That's what happened to the tithe because it was used in excess and that... Again, the Bible doesn't say much about that. So the rest of the work of the ministry of the sanctuary came through offerings. How much should you give? Well, how thankful are you? How thankful are you? And this is between you and the Lord. This isn't for me to tell you. I'm not going to audit your books and say, well, you could be a little more thankful, don't you think? Just between you and the Lord. How thankful are you? How much has He blessed you? How much do you trust in God's promises? If you're not accustomed to giving 10%, okay, uh, and your lifestyle has outgrown that, where really the best you can do is five, trust, how much do you trust God? Do you think God is going to leave you in a lurch? And there's all kinds of stories about how God has blessed those who've honestly uh, been charitable in their giving. How much do you want God to bless you? How much do you want to... Not that we're buying His blessings. Not that we're, we're um, appeasing an angry God or anything like that. But when you, think, when you ask the question, well, how much should I give? Ask yourself the question, well, how much do you want God's blessing? How much? We're so privileged to live in a, in a country where we have so many resources. And it is sad that in the last days, particularly the mission funds are drying up. In the most in the most affluent country. You know the Inter-America? Inter-America division, the one that I mentioned on here, do you know that they now give more tithe than the North American division? They have outpaced. Some of the poorest countries in the world are in the Inter-American division. And the Inter-American division now gives more tithe than North America. That's amazing. Talk about the widow's mites, right? That's amazing to me. The, uh, the great things that are happening in, in, in that part of the world are amazing. How thankful, how much do you trust God's promises? How much do you want Him to bless you? Just a challenge here in the end. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me now in this. To my knowledge, this is the only place and the only context in all of the scriptures where God invites us to test Him. Normally, we're not supposed to put the Lord to the test, Right? That's one of the things that, that Jesus tells the devil when he comes to tempt him in the wilderness. He says, you're not supposed to put the Lord to the test. But in this context, God invites us, test me in this. And if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. The money that you have left over from giving blessed will be of more abundance and success to you than the money that you keep that maybe God was asking you to give that you withheld. Giving is a blessing. Giving is godly. Giving is how we express our thankfulness and gratitude to God. And I am so excited to see that this church has moved forward and had a couple of strong months. And I just look forward to seeing that, uh, that blessing continue and to see the success of the ministry of this church because of the faithfulness of everyone who gives. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord, it's such a personal thing. It's such a, an individual thing. And for some of us, it, it really reaches down into the heart. It can, even, it can even be offensive at time to talk about uh, our giving. And I know a lot of the world uh, gets uh, inundated with the idea that all we care about is money. And Lord, we know that it's just simply a symbol. How we live and how we give symbolizes our relationship with you our trust in you, and it's how you have organized us to be cooperatively generous, Lord. So, Father, I just pray that each of our hearts would be challenged. There are so many pressures on us these days, so many 
uh, debt, so many bills, so many taxes. And the, the, the devil wants to keep us from this. But God, we know that your promise is always there and that you are faithful. If we trust you and we give and we give wholeheartedly and cheerfully that you will be with us, that you will see us through, and that you will multiply even those two little pennies that were paid by that widow will be multiplied and it will be used for the ministry of the gospel in these last days. So God, thank you for everyone. Thank you for working on our hearts and helping us, Father, to be as generous as you have been generous with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you come next week, we'll watch camp meeting together. Have a wonderful time. Have a great day.